Hey, Al Scott Horton here for the Future Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation. As you may already be aware, Jacob Hornberger, Sheldon Richmond, and James Bovard are awesome. They're also in every issue of the Future Freedom, and they're joined by others of the best of the libertarian movement. People like Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, Lawrence Vance, Joe Stromberg, and many more. Even me. Sign up for the Future Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 to read it online. That's the Future Freedom, edited by Sheldon Richmond at fff.org slash subscribe. And tell me heard it here all right y'all sorry for all the incoherent rambling on the show today probably doesn't sound much different to most of y'all but for anybody who doesn't like it i'm blaming the benadryl it's weird this benadryl it's got me high in a way where i don't feel high but then i think back on the things i was just saying and i realize that there's something wrong with me very strange this benadryl I, maybe you're not supposed to take it first thing in the morning with coffee. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the problem. I don't know. Anyway, so it's my show, The Scott Horton Show. And in the next segment, I'm going to do my best to be quiet and let Sheldon Richmond say great stuff. Hey, Sheldon, how are you doing? Welcome back to the show. I am doing fine, and uh, always great to be with you. Thanks for asking me. Good times. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, Sheldon Richmond, everybody, you know him. He's the vice president of the Future of Freedom Foundation at FFF.org. And uh, your, lace, your uh, latest piece here is U.S. Foreign Policy is a Shambles. And sorry for wasting your time, but let's start with a shambles. Isn't that a singular and a, pure, and a plural all mixed together and confusing my brain? <laughs> well, that wasn't a question I uh, was prepared for. <laughs> is that the proper really grammar prepared. there? A shambles? Yeah, I don't it's not in shambles? I think you can say in shambles, too. But I don't think you can say is a shamble. I'm not sure there's such a thing as a shamble. But I'll have to defer uh, to uh, linguists on this one. Yeah. I need to get, like, the great book of etymology. I, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Uh, I'm sure there are more than one. Yeah, there you go. Just make sure <laughs> to go to uh, the Scott Horton link to Amazon.com first, everybody, before you send me your gift. All right. Uh, so... U.S. foreign policy is in shambles. It's a shambles. I like a shambles. It's a shambles. That makes sense. As after it goes to shambles, then it's in shambles. It's a shambles. In shambles. Um, so, uh, yeah, the deal is uh, you, bring, you bring up uh, the point, the all-important point, that uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham uh, are lamenting that the Americans are not in the middle of the fight going on in Fallujah right now. Uh, yeah, they are. They're, they're very upset that uh, there's been this uh, resurgence of, uh, of Al-Qaeda and, Su and Sunni uh, um, activity and violence in uh, Anbar province, which is the Sunni part of, uh, of Iraq. And uh, while, you know, I heard after I wrote this, after it was published, uh, I did see uh, McCain on TV saying, well, I'm not saying we should send in uh, troops, because the American people wouldn't stand for that. That seems to be his only reason. <laughs> I think he'd like to send in troops. Of course, he's sorry troops left. And he doesn't even buy the uh, uh, the point that um, Obama tried hard to have the troops remain there. It's just that Maliki wouldn't uh, uh, give them immunity from Iraqi law, and which led to the uh, you know the final withdrawal of the troops. But, but, but McCain, McCain doesn't buy that. He, he wants to be able to blame Obama and say Obama didn't try hard enough to, to keep troops there. Uh, but, you know, like I say in the piece, he and, he and Graham have never seen an opportunity for U.S. intervention uh, that they didn't like. Well, we got that right. By the way, uh, Nick sends the uh, grammar errors, and it turns out that you're right and uh, that it's supposed to be a shambles, and I'm wrong that it could ever be in shambles. That is a incorrect way to use that term entirely it says here on this I have to look that up I, I, I thought you could say that but uh, I have to look that one up I'm, yeah. glad I, I'm glad I guessed and got it right it's only your way never the <laughs> other according to this website I've never seen before but they have a picture of a jackass next to in shambles and a wise owl next to a shambles so I think the question I, is settled so I guessed right yeah okay again sorry for wasting your time of the show. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, well, McCain, uh, at least he's not the president, huh? Yeah, we can be thankful for that. I mean, w whenever you want to really rail against Obama, just remember, it could 
It could have been McCain or it could have been Romney. Mm. Now let me ask you, do you think that uh, the guys in charge of uh, the American empire, is it that the, the Democrats just have a much different kind of opposite sort of policy than the Republicans? Or is it more or less consistently the same policymakers, but they're just complete idiots and have no idea what they're doing? Or is it a grand conspiracy to simply smash every society in the region and try to get them all to kill each other? Or what is going on over there? Because it doesn't yeah, seem to make... It, it sure looks like a shambles to me. You have to look at it, I think, person by person, because I think there are differences within the, within the Republicans uh, and within the Democrats. Uh, but I think the Democrats may be a, a little more sensitive to the idea that the Americans are sort of sick of uh, sending troops uh, off to uh, foreign lands, uh, of course, uh, that uh, that means they can, they can use uh, drones instead, or special ops, or something more subtle that's not so much in the headlines. So I don't want to, you know, we don't want to make them look too good by comparison to the Republicans. But the, I think they have this, uh, at, le at least compared to some, like McCain and, uh, and Graham and Lieberman, who we might as well throw into the Republican Party. Uh, versus them, the Democrats, I think, are a little more sensitive to the idea that are. But Americans uh, have gotten sick of, uh, of 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 troops being you know bogged down for years and years and years in uh, in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, and you know we saw what happened when uh, Obama wanted to launch attacks, not even not send troops, but launch attacks against Syria. Uh, the people stood up and said, "No way!" So that was a good sign. Yeah, um, although you know. I wonder about, well, and you know, it was, it was quite contrary to the media narrative. Although we also had, it seemed like Dempsey and the military really didn't want to do it. So I wonder if they had been for it, whether it would've, they would have gone ahead on or not. But Yeah, we, we, we won't know. Uh, we have to be thankful for, for uh, what we can get. And that, that was a shining moment when the people basically rose up. You know, the way I like to put it, and I think we've talked about this on the show before, uh, that uh, uh, that it was the people that stopped that attack, that that the beginnings of that war, U.S. participation in that war, yeah. not the Constitution, and nothing else. Because right. you know Obama still thinks he's got the constitutional power to do it uh, if he wants, and that he doesn't even need uh, congressional approval. But the people said, "We don't care what you think of the Constitution. We don't want to attack Syria." And so far, it stopped that. It stopped uh, the attack. Yep. And you know what, even if that is oversimplifying it a little bit, it's still a powerful precedent, and it's still mostly true, even if, you know, Obama was hesitant a bit himself, and even if the Joint Chiefs happen to agree with us, it, it is a, you know, there's no doubt that, um, you know, the establishment consensus was, whoa, well, a red line, oh, we got to do it, on, on, you know, all the liberal hawks and right-wing hawks agreed, and all that, and then what came through, which they just could not deny, was the poll numbers, where the American people were saying absolutely not by huge margins. And I remember, yeah. I guess better than anything uh, from that time, I remember the frustration of the cable news anchors, like Jake Tapper going, well, you know, when we come back, we're going to have an in-depth look at what can the president say to the American people to get them on board for this thing. Like, that was just the only way that they could look at it. It was so frustrating to them. Uh, that's Amazing. right. The Republicans, the Republicans tried to, you know, macho uh, Obama into it by, keep, by uh, continually raising the, uh, the red line issue. Yeah. Obama then backed away. Remember, Obama backed away and said, "Well, I didn't set a red, a red line. The world set a red line." So he could, he distanced himself from it, give, right. giving him some uh, yeah some room to uh, to then uh, go with the Russian plan to destroy the uh, chemical weapons in uh, in Syria, which of course the, the, and that's happening. I guess to the uh, to the distress of the Republicans, they would love to be able to catch Assad in a violation of that, and then say, "See, we were right all along. Let's attack." So far, that's not happening, so that's another good thing. Yeah. And, you know, as... Uh, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, we keep pointing out all these good things, and uh, so why am I saying that foreign policy is, <laughs> is a shambles? <laughs> well, I guess that's a fair question. It, it could be worse. It could be President McCain, and, you know, so we can always right. imagine, you know, how much worse it could be. But, yeah, no, I mean... 
Uh, it's true that if Obama had really been determined to start a war in Syria, he sure could have, and he didn't. And and the American people's opposition certainly did have a large role to play in that, and that is an important thing to note. Um, right. But uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not over there, uh, you know, causing all kinds of problems all day long and, and selling weapons to all sides and and all kinds of madness. Which you know, sticking with Syria for a minute here, um, you know, I kind of wondered whether Obama was afraid that. Ultimately, I mean, come on, he's not as dumb as McCain. They're they're both as criminal as each other, I think. But McCain has just got air between his ears. Where Obama had to have been thinking ahead that man, he would really be going down in history as a guy who fought a war for Al Qaeda in Syria, and that that could really be bad. <laughs> you know, I don't know that maybe it would be too bad to ignore. You know, when the when the suicide bombers come to power in Damascus because they, and thanking him for it on TV and as they blow themselves up or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know. I think maybe that was part of it. Was that you know that he's been going along with the arming the the opposition all this time i don't mean to acquit him for it but i think he's been really afraid to help them win you know uh yeah i think that's right i mean uh, you had a good interview i think uh, a couple of good interviews lately both with uh gareth porter and uh, and uh, uh patrick coburn and uh, where a lot of that was brought out right that uh uh, it's not really clear <laughs> if obama who, who, whom obama wants to win or, or whether he would just wants things wants things to remain in the stalemate in Syria, yeah. Because uh, they do seem to grasp the problem if uh, if the Al Qaeda types prevail in Syria, and we see some really bad things happening there. Uh, on the other hand, you know Assad's not a nice guy either. So uh, I don't know. Maybe he's taking the position that maybe that the Israelis have taken that let things just remain sort of you know in turmoil without it being tilted one way or the other, and that maybe they've calculated that that's the best thing, but. But of course, they're concerned about what's happening in Iraq because, you know, after the U.S. investment there, it looks like, oh my gosh, it was for nothing. Because we always we always knew it wasn't for any uh, <clears throat> good cause. It certainly didn't do the Americans any good or the the dead Iraqis any good. But uh, but now, you know, you hear people say, uh, oh well, we you know we shed so much blood or we lost uh, so much blood, men and you know personnel and treasure. In Fallujah, only to have it now come into the hands of Al Qaeda. So, you know, you know, how can we just stand by and, and let that happen? In other words, let's, so let's pour more blood and treasure, you know, after after the, what we've already lost, as if that could somehow bring back what what was lost. And that's the way people seem to be looking at it. Some people seem to be looking at the, the events in Iraq. But you know, like you and I have discussed before, and you've discussed it many times with other guests, the, the Iraqi policy has always been incoherent. Because on the one hand, we have the, uh, Iran being our, our bête noire, you know, the, our mortal enemy, Iran, uh, and, yet, and yet we went into Iraq and did Iran's bidding by getting rid of their mortal enemies, Saddam Hussein, and, and turning it over to the Shiites. Uh, so uh, it was always incoherent. Well, it was really stupid what they did there, right? I mean, or I don't know. Do you think that they deliberately thought that, like, yeah, we'll make a majority Shiite Arab country in the center of the Sunni Arab world and that'll cause them to all hate each other man that'll that'll set up some dominoes and some excuses or they they just really thought it would be easy or what you know I wish I knew I, knew. I, I really can't get myself inside their heads and maybe that's a compliment to me that I can't think of yeah way exactly think. come on what Sheldon you your I'm inner not... madman has got to explain uh, I try to pretend I try to pretend I'm Richard Pearl but it just doesn't work uh, or, or Rumsfeld. Uh, you know, the only thing that would make sense is if they had, you know, a regime change in Iran next on the agenda. Uh, but, you know, that that doesn't strike me as quite likely because that's a huge job, obviously, and I, I just don't think they were figuring that, you know, we then move on to Iran and overthrow them or even that we that somehow... They couldn't possibly believe that sanctions were going to cause the Iranian people to rise up and overthrow the... Uh, the regime. I mean, uh, surely they didn't believe that because who could who could possibly believe that? So I don't I don't know what they were thinking. I I think it, I think it was play it by ear. And I think Gareth said this uh, the other day. I was just listening to it yesterday, but it's, uh, it was within the last week mm-hmm. that, 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 it, that they improvise, right? They, they, right it's they, all ad hoc. They make it up. They make it up as they go along, right? right? And it's somewhat it's somewhat determined by what they did last. But the last move was determined uh, in a 
was just an improvisation based on what they did previously. So I don't. I think we're wrong to look for some grand strategy. I don't right. think they think like that. And I think Obama has carried that on. I mean, in a sense, he was, uh, you, you know, he was stuck with it. And uh, uh, even though he wanted to keep troops there, uh, for whatever the reason, I don't know. Uh, of course, you know, I don't believe he was ever really against the Iraq, uh, Iraq war a- anyway. Uh, Gates, <laughs> Gates might uh, give us some reason to suspect that in his new book. But also, uh, you know, you recall that during the election, the primaries against uh, Hillary, he was asked would he have voted against uh, uh, the uh, authorization for the use of force against Iraq uh, under Bush, and he said, if I was in the Senate, if I'd been in the Senate, I don't know how I would have voted. That didn't get a whole lot of attention. Now, Bill Clinton right, tried to yeah, make a big deal right. of it. That was part of a fairy tale that Bill Clinton complained about when his wife was getting beaten up. But that was a very telling remark. He's not a pre- he wasn't principled an anti-war uh, person. Uh, you know, it sounds funny to even say that these days. But but there he is confessing that you know, for all the bluster he made about being one of the only ones who opposed that that uh, resolution on force, uh, he says he doesn't know how he would have voted. Had he been back uh, back in the, in the Senate in those days, so yeah. you know, I don't know what the heck's going through their minds. I think he wants to get through his term and have things kind of look good, so that his legacy is secure, and you know, otherwise leave it to his uh, his uh, successor. Right. Uh, yeah, that's what Bush said too. And they asked him about, you know, well, what do you think the end of the Iraq War will look like? And he said, "You'll have to ask some other president because it ain't <laughs> going to end on my watch, man. I'm just staying until time runs out for me, and it'll be somebody else's problem, like Lyndon Johnson too. I will not seek. I will not accept another four years because then this war might have to end in total failure while I'm here. <laughs> I don't want that. I'll be in Texas. Let Nixon take the heat for it." So I guess if we, you know, if we want to be really charitable, we can give them both credit for realizing that the U.S. can't dictate events there. I mean, the U.S. can kill a lot of people and get a lot of uh, people killed, including Americans, and create a lot of destruction and havoc. But they don't seem to suffer really. Maybe some of the, some of his advisors uh, did, Bush's advisors, but they don't. The two of them don't seem to have suffered under the delusion that they could actually micromanage events there. So that actually is something to say in their favor. Now, they didn't pull out and, and totally you know, get out of there, uh, and Obama didn't until he really had to. But at least they seemed to understand that uh, they, they just needed to sort of management, manage it until they got out of office because there was no way they could uh, you know, fix things in any, in, in any sense. Well, I wonder if I had my own think tank up there or whatever, maybe they'd have to consider me a genius because I would argue... That, hey guys, what if we made a real peace with Iran, and then that way, uh, that could completely neutralize uh, all the different messes that we're in. It won't matter that we accidentally fought a war for them in Iraq. Like, this is the, the second place alternative to regime change in Tehran. How about that? Just make friends out of these guys, and it won't matter that you helped them out in Iraq. It won't matter that their allies are in power in Damascus or in southern Lebanon either because they're friends of ours anyway, so who cares? It'll be just like the old days, only without having a complete and total sock puppet dictatorship. We'll just have a friendly and mostly compliant government over there. They would go along with an offer like that if the Americans were sincere about it. And then uh, that turns, and then we can lord that over the Saudis all day. We can do whatever we want. We won't be so dependent on them anymore because we'll have our friends, the Iranians, back and all of that, right? Like, I could be a complete, as, as evil as a sociopath as I can try to be, you know, like I wrote for Foreign Affairs or something like that, and what we should do over there. Brilliant. We'll befriend our enemies, right? Why well, not? I think, I, think, I, think it, I think it is a brilliant stroke, and I wish they would do that. He seems ambivalent, like he... At times there are signs he wants to do that, and other times because he's getting pressure from the other side, from APAC and from uh, hawkish elements of the Democratic Democratic Party, not to mention the Republicans. So I think that's why the message is so mixed. But but I think that is a very good idea. I mean, you can uh, wrote that, one saying we ought to outright ally with Iran the same way we allied with Stalin against Hitler. Go ahead and ally with Iran against Al Qaeda. That'll help wipe them out, man. The Iranians they know the region. We'll, we'll arm up Hezbollah against my guess now. <laughs> yeah, Speaking my only fear of switching go, you know, sides they'll go, they'll back and go, forth. My only fear is they'll go too far the other way and, and, and actually get actively involved in that instead of just staying out. I, I, but I agree. They should, they should uh, sign some papers with Iran so that there's now this uh, declaration of friendship and open trade and tourism. That would be wonderful. 
of course, Netanyahu and the rest of the Israeli government uh, will be upset because then they can't use Iran as an existential threat, which is very useful uh, that, that way. But how, how are they going to claim Iran as an existential threat if it's friendly with the United States? So, right. that, you know, he, so that's one reason why he can't fully embrace that, if, even if he does glimpse the wisdom of it. Right. Yeah, wait, why are we sending F-16s to Israel again when they don't have any enemies that aren't friends of ours and we don't have the influence to protect them? Oops. Well, that's right. And, and you know, the, the Israeli military, as we know, is, is not enthusiastic at all about a conflict with, uh, with Israel and uh, with Iran. Uh, they don't seem to see Iran as an existential threat. I saw Steve Clemens on TV, I think earlier this week, uh, tell uh, Andrew Mitchell or somebody, that the Israeli, Israeli intelligence are, are telling Netanyahu that there's been a sea change in Iran, that, that Iran is not this uh, threat, if it ever was. It's not a threat now. Uh, Netanyahu you know, doesn't want to believe it and can't say that because it's too useful. So I'm not sure they, I don't know if they'd really want regime change in Iran uh, you know, to bring back a type of Shah type that was friendly with Israel because then you, you've, lost, you've lost Iran as an existential threat, which is very useful because it, they try to use it to take uh, people's minds off the Palestinians and what they're doing to the Palestinians and, and these bogus talks, which, of course, the Obama administration is just playing right along uh, with. Uh, so, uh, they, they, in a sense, they need Iran. And uh, that's why I think they won't like anything which uh, says to the world, hey, Iran, it can be a normal country. It doesn't mean it's a libertarian country. It doesn't mean the government's the kind of government any of us want to live under. Uh, even, even a limited government <laughs> libertarian isn't going to want to live under uh, the supreme leader. But that doesn't mean there needs to be a Cold War or a, or a covert war or a proxy war where we uh, aid uh, and prompt uh, terrorist groups to go into Iran and, and do bad things, blow things up, or uh, help uh, or encourage Israel to kill scientists or any of that stuff. We, we can be friendly and still not like the re- not not the, think the regime is a is a good regime because I don't think the Obama I don't think the American regime is a good regime, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, but uh, you know, that doesn't mean it should be war. All right, and now, uh, in the last couple of minutes here, uh, talk to us about Egypt. What's the future of America's relationship with the government there, do you think? Well, yeah, I don't know what the future is. I mean, it, uh, that's something I uh, talked a little bit about in the piece. Uh, I think that does expose the American uh, policy for, uh, you know, how bad it is. I mean, what possible reason does the... Well, I, I can name the possible reasons. I shouldn't put it that way. Uh, you know, you might wonder, why is the United States siding with this, you know, this, this basically military dictatorship that overthrew an elected government is now, you know, uh, once it's going to the try, uh, finally to try Morsi, the, the president that they knocked off, is uh, making the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, you know, declaring it illegal in a terrorist group and then cracking down on... Uh, on people's civil liberties, if they have sympathy for Morsi, or the um, you know why is the uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood? Why is the U.S. Uh, taking this stance when it claims to be for democracy? Uh, and won't even call it a coup because uh, legally a coup, would, uh, if it was a coup, it would, have, it would require the U.S. to cut off the uh, what is it, the billion and a half dollars of uh, military aid that Egypt gets every year. Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons. I mean, the U.S. has never liked uh, independent, non-aligned countries in the Middle East or anywhere else. Right? They they, they want uh, those countries uh, dependent on the U.S. and, and not uh, doing anything that U.S. leaders believe is, is contrary to uh, what they call American interests, but we, we know what that means, the interests of the ruling elite and the military-industrial complex. So the, 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 they must see, as they, as they long have seen, the uh, Egyptian military is the safest way to keep Egypt in the, in the U.S., Camp and, and, and related to that, of course, is that he, Egypt has this uh, peace treaty with with um, Israel, which was uh, engineered by Jimmy Carter in 1978. And so Egypt has done Israel's bidding in, uh, in, in you know not, in not uh, doing too much to support the Palestinians and particularly uh, Gaza. Uh, and and so uh, the U.S. under pressure from Israel doesn't want to do anything to alienate Egypt. You know, I guess one reason they were worried. About one reason they were worried about uh, Morsi was that, uh, you know, it's possible that he wasn't going to carry out the terms of the uh, peace agreement anymore. Right. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry we ran out of time on that. That's a big subject to bring up right at the end yeah. of the show there, but we're out of time. But uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks very much, Sheldon. Appreciate it. Okay. Have a good weekend, Scott. Bye-bye. All right, that's the great show of Richmond from the Future Freedom Foundation. We'll see you Sunday morning on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. ScottHorn.org. Hey, y'all, Scott here, hawking stickers for the back of your truck. They've got some great ones at LibertyStickers.com. Get your son killed, Jeb Bush, 2016. FDR, no longer the worst president in American history. The National Security Agency, blackmailing your congressman since 1952. And USA, sometimes we back Al-Qaeda, sometimes we don't. And there's over a thousand other great ones on the wars, police, state, elections, the Federal Reserve, and more at LibertyStickers.com. They'll take care of all your custom printing for your band or your business at TheBumperSticker.com. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else is sticker. Suck. Hey, I'll Sky here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make the show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. Hey, I'll Scott here for MyHeroesThink.com. They sell beautiful 7-inch busts of libertarian heroes Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, and Harry Brown. I've got the Harry Brown one on the bookshelf now. Makes me smile every time it catches my eye. These finely crafted statues from MyHeroesThink.com make excellent decorations for your desktop at work, bookends for your shelves, or gifts for that special individualist in your life. They're also all available in colors now, too. Of course, gold, silver, or bronze. Coming soon, Hayek, Hazlitt, Carlin. Use promo code Scott Horton and save $5 at MyHeroesThink.com. Hey y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson is a successful former hedge fund manager whose site is unique on the web. Subscribers are allowed a window into Mike's very real main account and receive announcements and explanations for all his market moves. The Federal Reserve has been inflating the money supply to finance the bank bailouts and terror war overseas. So Mike's betting on commodities, mining stocks, European markets, and other hedges against our depreciating dollar. Play along on paper or with real money and then be your own judge of Mike's investment strategies. See what happens at WallStreetWindow.com. Oh, man, I'm late. Sure hope I can make my flight. Stand there. Me? I am standing here. Come here. Okay. Hands up. Turn around. Oh, easy. Into the scanner. Ooh, what's this in your pants? Hey, slow down. It's just my... Hold it right there. Your wallet has tripped the metal detector. What's this? The bill of... That's right. It's just a harmless, stainless steel business card-sized copy of the Bill of Rights from SecurityEdition.com. There for exposing the TSA is a bunch of liberty-destroying goons who've never protected anyone from anything. Sir, now give me back my wallet and get out of my way. Got a plane to catch. Have a nice day. Play a leading role in the security theater with the Bill of Rights Security Edition from SecurityEdition.com. It's the size of a business card, so it fits right in your wallet, and it's guaranteed to trip the metal detectors wherever the police state goes. That's securityedition.com. And don't forget their great Fourth Amendment socks. Hey guys, I got his laptop.